Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Um, this is panel three, regulating the modern workforce. Um, so the first thing I want to do is introduce myself and also uh, the distinguished uh, panel here. Uh, my name is John Yoon. I'm an associate professor of law here at the George Mason Law School. I'm also the uh, director of economic education at the Global Antitrust Institute, which is also housed here um, at Scalia Law. Um, and so without further ado, let me go ahead and, and introduce uh, our panel. I'll start with uh, Clark Neely. He's the vice president for criminal justice at Cato. Um, before joining Cato last year, uh, Mr. Neely was a senior attorney and constitutional litigator at the Institute for Justice and director of the Institute's Center for Judicial Engagement. He also served as co-counsel in District of Columbia versus Heller, and he also is an adjunct professor at the University of Texas School of Law. Uh, next to him is James Cooper, is an associate professor of law and director of the Program on Economics and Privacy here at Scalia Law. Prior to joining the faculty at George Mason, he's spent several years at the Federal Trade Commission, including um, being the advisor to Commissioner William Kavasik. Um, Dr. Cooper has a PhD in economics from Emory University and a JD from George Mason, where he was a Levy Fellow. Ryan Nunn is a fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution and policy director for the Hamilton Project. He was previously a labor and public finance economist in the Office of Economic Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. He is also an adjunct instructor at the uh, University of Maryland, and he received his doctorate in public policy and economics from the University of Michigan. Gabe Scheffler is a regulation fellow at the Penn Program on Regulation at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Before joining the Penn Law School, he was a staff economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors and a research assistant at the Harvard Kennedy School Center for International Development. So before we get into uh, each panel's opening remarks, I just wanted to have a few comments to, to set the stage. Um, obviously, today's title of this um, panel is Regulating the Modern Workforce. It's a big topic, so we're going to narrow it down to, I believe, occupational licensing and focus on that. You might ask, what does that have to do with the sharing economy? And it could very much have, a, uh, have something to do with it, especially as this, if it continues to grow, it's going to impact more and more occupations, and it could impact um, some of the suppliers on these platforms, such as Uber and the, and the drivers. And if it impacts them, it could obviously impact consumers ultimately. So um, those are certainly important and relevant issues. So what is occupational licensing? I'm, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but it's the idea that if you want to be a doctor in South Carolina, you have to get approval from the state to be a doctor. And we come to expect that almost for a doctor, an electrician, even a plumber, um, a lawyer, um, but perhaps not something for like a florist, which is perhaps a, a very extreme example, but an extre example nonetheless. I won't steal Clark Sunder if he's going to talk about the florist. Then. Louisiana, but I think it's in a pretty stark case study of perhaps occupational licensing gone wild. Although I've noted, I don't think you need to have a license to teach at a university. So I don't know what that means. Um, so it's great. It's great. It's efficiency, or 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 maybe, yeah, <laughs> true. That's true. Um, so I think what's going to come out, hopefully from today's discussion, I'm almost sure, is why do we have them? When are they justified? When are they not? Has it gone too far? As the keynote speaker addressed, maybe it's not the regulations that's a problem per se, but the depth of the regulation, how it's regulated, and that can hopefully also emerge as well. So um, with those remarks, I'll, I'll open up with Clark. Thanks, John, and uh, thank you to Greg and, and everybody at the uh, George Mason in the Journal of Law and Economics. It's uh, great to be, have the opportunity to speak to people about one of my favorite topics, um, occupational licensing. Uh, it's one of my favorite topics because it's one of the worst things there is. Uh, and as a sort of a, a lifelong contrarian and, and constitutional litigator, I did devote um, the bulk of my professional experience to challenging occupational licensing laws. Uh, including, as John referenced, uh, probably the craziest one I've ever challenged. Um, it is, in fact, the case that you have to have a government license in the state of Louisiana to be a florist. If you take two flowers and put them together in an aesthetically appealing way, you may not sell that because that's an arrangement. Uh, you may not sell that without approval from the state. Um, that's quite crazy from one standpoint. 
but it makes perfect sense from the other standpoint. If you're a not very talented florist in Louisiana, but you happen to have a government license, you like that law uh, a lot for obvious reasons. Let me say this as, as someone who uh, sp spent really the bulk of, of the last 20 years or so representing people in occupational licensing cases. Um, the, how easy or hard it is for people to engage in productive work is one of the most important questions in this country, or frankly any other country. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first one is rather obvious. Uh, it's because the more productive people are, uh, the better the economy does and the better for everybody. But there's also a personal reason. Uh, and as some of you probably know, um, all kinds of personal problems and dysfunctions are highly correlated with unemployment, particularly as you get older, uh, and talking about things like depression and drug use and even suicide. And so when people are put in a position where they feel that they are unable to be productive, it's not just a matter of putting food on your family's table, although that's important too, but it's a matter of feeling that you are a productive and important part of society. And so it's extraordinarily important what message we send to people uh, through our policies and through the regulations that we enforce. And increasingly, the message that we send to people in this country is, you may not engage in productive activity without the prior permission of some government official. And that is a disastrously bad message mm -hmm. to send to people. Uh, and when I say we're doing it more and more, the numbers are quite striking. In the 1950s, only 5% of the American workforce was subject to occupational licensing. Today, it's somewhere between 25 and 30%, and it appears to be climbing. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically, it's a policy that for a variety of reasons has sort of taken on a life of its own. Um, I'll touch on a couple of those uh, reasons why I think that notwithstanding the fact that occupational licensing um, is so destructive, both of individuals and for our economy, uh, that it, it nevertheless seems to be on the rise and it seems to be increasing. I think the first reason is that for many people, it's just part of our mental landscape. It's just part of what we expect when we go out in the world. We see that doctors and lawyers are licensed and various other vocations, and we sort of come to expect it. And relatedly, I think that there's a very common misperception that people have that uh, the benefits of occupational licensing are real and maybe even substantial, and the costs are minimal uh, if they exist at all. And in fact, actually, that gets it exactly backwards. Research uh, indicates that it's very difficult to establish any real benefits from occupational licensure, and I'm including here even the professions. It is not clear that licensing doctors or lawyers or other professions uh, produces any significant benefits, and the costs are documented and extreme. Uh, Professor Morris Kleiner, uh, who's an economist at the uh, University of Minnesota, estimates that the um, annual cost of occupational licensing is somewhere in the order of $200 billion uh, and a loss of substantial number of jobs. So this is a very real issue. It's a, it's a, and it's a huge concern. <clears throat> so uh, an important question is where does it come from? Why do we have so much occupational licensing if it's so destructive um, and if the benefits are so difficult to document if they even exist and the costs are so palpable. And I think it comes from two basic uh, impulses or, or two basic dynamics. Uh, first, in my experience and based on my perception as someone who's worked in this area for many years, it is absolutely the case that industry groups drive uh, occupational licensing. Occupational licensing almost never occurs because some bunch of consumers uh, you know, felt that they were getting ripped off or underserved, and so they went to the legislature and said, hey, we need to regulate this particular vocation. Um, quite the opposite, it's the members of the uh, vocation in question go to the legislature and say, hey, we should really be licensed. We should be regulated. They're not doing that, of course, out of the goodness of their hearts. They're doing that for nakedly anti-competitive reasons. And that explains, uh, I think, uh, pretty clearly every vocational licensing uh, effort or challenge that I've been involved with, and I've seen it over and over again. Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, legislators don't like to say no to constituents. And uh, many of these industry groups are pretty sophisticated with, with how they go about it. Uh, and you don't have to be terribly sophisticated. You just do it quietly. Uh, so if you want to get uh, a state to pass an interior design law, uh, that was probably the, the, the longest sustained challenge. I, I personally battled the interior design industry over licensing for about eight years. Uh, you don't have to be super sophisticated. You just put together a proposal and you quietly make an appointment with the relevant legislators. Uh, and if it's the right year and you talk to the right people, you're going to get that law in the books. Um, 
you know, there's this joke in, uh, in criminal law that uh, a, a competent prosecutor could, could indict a ham sandwich. Um, I'll tell you, on the other side, a competent lobbyist could get that same ham sandwich appointed head of any occupational licensing board you want to you name. Um, and so it's just not a big lift to get occupational licensing enacted uh, in the legislature. So I think that's where it comes from. Uh, and one of the things we can sort of look at to see how dubious we ought to be or how suspicious we ought to be about the claims that people make, the proponents of licensing, um, and it might not occur to you right off the bat, but we look for variations in licensing. Um, I think, uh, although I don't <clears throat> really think that any occupational licensing benefits people, I would probably uh, concede that licensing doctors at least is not completely crazy uh, and, um, and, and maybe, maybe could even provide some benefits, although I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical. But notably, every state licenses doctors and they all have basically the same licensing requirements. And so to me, that's at least some evidence uh, or it tends to suggest that there's really something going on there other than just uh, you know, rent seeking and, and, uh, and, and naked anti-competitive impulses. When we look at other <coughs> occupations, of course, a, a lot of that goes out the window. Uh, and so we, we can look for variations among states and among vocations. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in Maryland, it takes about 280 days of training to become a barber, um, which is insane. That's a lot of days. But in Idaho, it's 630 days. Uh, and so we ask ourselves, why on earth would it take twice as long? It's actually two and a quarter times as long to be a barber in Idaho. Is there something about the hair that you know, you're cutting in Idaho? And of course, the answer is no. Uh, and to put that variation in kind of context that probably more of us would be able to appreciate, um, that would be uh, as if, for example, here in Virginia, as in all states, uh, it, it, you have to, it's three years, law school is three years, basically, about 1,200 hours of training. But imagine in Idaho it was seven years to complete law school. We would think that rather odd. And of course, that's seven years of money out of your pocket, an opportunity cost during which you're not working. Um, so that's an example of a variation that might give us pause. Um, we can also look within uh, the, the same state. So for example, in Michigan, it takes about 1,800 hours of coursework to be a barber, but as I mentioned a moment ago, only 1,200 hours worth of coursework to be a lawyer. Now, I'm not gonna stand up for the legal profession, although I've been in it for a long time, but I kind of suspect that it's um, got a larger body of knowledge that you need to master than cutting somebody's hair. Um, no offense if somebody has both a barber and a law degree in here and you wanna challenge me on that. Um, I think one of the craziest variations that you'll see, and this persists in pretty much every state, um, is the difference between how much training it takes to become a certified uh, emergency medical technician, an EMT, the person who goes and literally saves lives at the side of a road. Um, in New Jersey, it takes 28 days to become an EMT. It takes 280 days, 10 times as much training to be a cosmetologist or a barber. And a locksmith? 1176 days. Uh, so however the math works out there, I guess that's 30 times as more, more complicated to be a locksmith than to be an EMT. Um, and I'll stop with the numbers there. Of course, I could go on for some time, but the point I'm making is, um, well, I'll throw in one more because this is really important. One of the biggest giveaways is when you see an occupation that is onerously regulated, but not regulated in very many states. So for example, I mentioned interior design. There are only three states that regulate uh, interior designers, and it's one of the most difficult vocational licenses to get outside of the traditional professions. You actually have to, in Florida, where I fought interior design licensing, you have to have a college degree, you have to do a two-year apprenticeship, and you have to pass what amounts to a bar exam for interior designers that most people fail the first time they take it. So why on earth should it be so onerous to get this license? You would think there's really something at stake here, right? But then you look at the 47 states that don't regulate interior designers, and there are zero problems. And, and it's not, I'm not speculating, I'm not asserting. It has been studied, and there are literally zero problems in the state, the 47 states that don't regulate interior design. And again, I think that's the giveaway. We know it's all about naked economic protectionism. Uh, so what can we do about it? That's really what we want to focus on, I think, during this talk, because that's the most important thing. Uh, and what I think we have to do is we have to change both you know, sort of ordinary people's mindset and we have to rewire the heads of legislators. We have to get them to understand two important things. First of all, we have to get them to understand that these requests for licensure are not innocent and they are generally not public spirited. They do come from industry and they are driven by a desire for protectionism and not to protect 
the public. The second thing we need to get policymakers to understand is that occupational licensure should be a policy of last resort, not first resort. There are so many other things we can do if there are genuine concerns um, about consumer protection, about public safety, about uh, other genuinely public spirited concerns in, that, in, in a given vocation. And I'm just going to very quickly um, identify three of them. So first we can just go with private governance. That's getting more and more um, uh, sort of uh, plausible these days. We've got all kinds of feedback mechanisms. Almost every one of us in this room probably has a smartphone like you, uh, like me. Some of you probably have Yelp and Lyft and Uber on it. Uh, all of those are platforms uh, that are, enable consumers to provide real-time feedback and you get to look at it. That is so much better and uh, more reliable than some bureaucratic oversight. Um, there's also, uh, so that's market competition through ratings and reviews. There's also private certification, which is essentially when you complete some course, like you're a Microsoft certified programmer. Government doesn't have anything to do with that. Guess what? Um, you could make a really strong case for licensing auto mechanics, but no state does. Why? Because we have private certification. People trust that when you go to a garage and the guy there is privately certified um, to work on your transmission or your brakes, he knows what he's doing. Um, outside of private governance, we have public regulation. That includes things like um, inspections, uh, Deceptive Trade Practices Act laws that, that uh, identify uh, how uh, vocations should conduct themselves or members of vocations, and we have things like mandatory bonding and insurance to make sure if somebody injures you or destroys your property, they're going to have the money to be able to uh, pay you back and make you whole. And then finally, and this is the most restrictive and this is why it should be a policy of last resort, we have occupational licensing. But even short of that, there are a couple things the government can do that are less onerous. Um, it can have mandatory registration. So that doesn't say who can do the work, it just says if you're going to be doing the work, if you're going to be putting roofs on houses after hurricane, you have to register with the state so we know who you are um, and, and where to get you if you rip somebody off. Um, or we can have government certification, where the government actually provides its imprimatur to people who amass a certain amount of training or certification. It's just short of licensing. It doesn't say you can't work if you don't have that uh, training and those credentials. It says we won't put our imprimatur on you. And sometimes that matters in some vocations to have the government imprimatur. So uh, the takeaway is it's extraordinarily important that we send the right message to people, that we enable them to engage in productive work. Um, we're going in exactly the wrong direction as a country on that. What will get us headed in the right direction is to help policymakers understand that occupational licensing must be a policy of last resort, and there's an awful lot you can do short of occupational licensing to address the concerns uh, that consumers may have. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Uh, James? Uh, thanks. I want to thank JLEP for the symposium here and, 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 and letting me talk. Uh, kind of like Clark, I have been working in this area for a long time. I was a long time antitrust practitioner and moved over to the FTC. Uh, and something that uh, is, is in our, our, our piece, uh, uh, my piece with Josh and Elise, that uh, um, talks about a advocacy. It's a little known program, I think, maybe not little known in the circles I run in, but uh, the FTC has had a long and bipartisan history of being involved in using its, uh, its platform as an expert in competition consumer protection to advocate against uh, state restrictions on competition that are unduly restrictive. So uh, I've been involved in this space for, for a long time, so it's great to have an opportunity um, to talk about it. Now, um, we, we just heard from Clark about all the, the ills that come from occupational licensing, the way that it's, uh, it's set up to restrict competition. So you'd think, okay, well, these occupational licensing laws are set up to restrict competition, Antitrust is about making sure markets are competitive. Why don't we just use an antitrust as a tool? Um, it seems like it'd be a no-brainer, but it's not that simple. Uh, we live in a federalist system, and in that system, the states are sovereign. And what that means is that when the states decide to enact a policy that restricts competition, uh, that's a decision by, by the sovereign, and you can't use the antitrust laws to, um, to knock that down. Indeed, the, when the court, uh, the Supreme Court uh, rejected the, the Lochner era, saying that there's no constitutional right to a free market, it wouldn't make much sense to then allow the antitrust laws to be a rear guard action to come in and attack state laws under antitrust. In fact, the seminal case of Parker versus Brown was exactly that. It was a New Deal era program, a raisin cartel set up by the states, um, challenged under the antitrust laws. 
And in that case, the, the court enunciated what has come to be known as the state action doctrine that um, <clears throat> essentially said that these, when the state decides to replace competition with a regulatory scheme, that's beyond the reach of the antitrust laws because, again, the states are sovereign in our federalist system. So um, what, if that, what if that mean? Does that mean that these licensing regimes are, are beyond the reach? Well, actually not. Uh, if you, uh, there, there's more, the, this doctrine's rich, and, and I've spent a long time studying it, and there, uh, the, the, it's, it's something you could teach a, a whole class, a, you know, semester teaching, but the, the, the long and short of it is that it's, while it's true that states are not, um, while you can't use the federal antitrust laws to, uh, <clears throat> to attack a state uh, a, a state law that displaces competition with a regulatory scheme, by the same token, the states can't just repeal the antitrust laws. Now, what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, if a state wants to, say, enact a minimum wage or a price support and say that, you know, all orange growers will get X percent markup, a state can do that through the legislature. That's the state acting as a sovereign. Um, what it can't do is farm out this dirty work to private citizens, uh, to, to private actors, and say, okay, orange growers, if you, I'm sure you would like to figure out what price you should charge for your oranges, so you guys figure it out, have a cartel. That's, in fact, a repeal of the Sherman Act, okay? And you can't do that. So what, um, what as the court, um, the court said in Mid-Cal, uh, uh, another famous case that involved, a seminal case that involved a resale price maintenance scheme, uh, <clears throat> the court said you can't cast a, goes, a gauzy cloak of state involvement over what is essentially a private price-fixing agreement. And in that case, it enunciated um, this two-part, uh, this two-pronged test that still with us today that says if the state is going to delegate, if, you know, so the sovereign itself can pass, can supplant competition with regulation, that's no problem, but if the sovereign wants to delegate that, this, that ability to displace competition uh, with some kind of regulatory, regulatory scheme, it has to be that these actors are, one, acting pursuant to a clearly articulated and affirmatively expressed, expressed state policy to displace competition in this manner, and second, these ultimate actions need to be actively supervised by the state to assure fealty to that policy. Okay. And what this doctrine is all about, as it's evolved, this mid-cow test, it's about assigning political responsibility. So it says, well, you know, the states can displace competition, that's fine, um, but if they're going to do it and if they're going to delegate it to private parties, they ultimately have to own that. They can't just farm it out to non-state actors and, uh, and then let the consequences go. They have to take ownership of it, and if it's something the po they, at least in theory, if it's something the population doesn't like, then it'll be those, those politicians will be voted out of office. And again, the state action doctrine that's evolved is about political accountability. So the doctrine, you know, since Parker versus Brown, there have been some contours that have been added to it, and, you know, some clear lines have emerged. One, and this fits, is that rent-seeking is okay. Okay, we know that most of these laws are, especially these occupational licensing laws, as, as, as Clark laid out, are the product of, you know, kind of a public choice-like bargain or rent-seeking, where you go to the state house and, and you, get these, you get these nice occupational licensing schemes put in place. Well, as the court said in, uh, in Omni and other places, that, you know, that's okay. Uh, you know, that is just kind of the give and take of the political system, and we don't use the antitrust laws to police that, even corruption. There are laws against corruption, but the antitrust laws are not one of them. So even if an anti-competitive law is a product of corruption, it's not the domain of, uh, it's not the domain of antitrust. Um, another thing that's come out, another kind of clear line that's come out of uh, the state action doctrine is that municipalities don't need to be actively supervised. That's yeah, from a case called Town of Halley, and, 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 and again, other re re reaffirmed in other cases. But it, that is, so an, a municipality can enact some sort of anti-competitive uh, uh, regulation. Now, a municipality is not sovereign, so they don't, we, they don't get the respect that the state legislature does in a, in a federalist system. Nonetheless, because they're not a private entity, uh, 
we have a little more assurance that what they do is likely to be in the public interest. So as long as they're acting pursuant to affirmatively expressed uh, an affirmatively expressed state policy to displace competition, then that's okay. We don't require them to also be actively supervised by um, <clears throat> the state. That said, um, another another thing that has come out. Uh, there's been a lot of litigation in the in in, in the air, and the courts wrestled with what is clear articulation, most recently in Phoebe Putney, which is a case brought by the Federal Trade Commission uh, dealing with uh, uh, health care entity in a, a merger of, of two health care entities in, in Georgia. And, and the idea that clear articulation isn't just mere state authorization for this subdivision to act. It actually has to be an affirmatively expressed policy to displace competition in that manner. And the the, the the way that competition's been, been displaced has to be foreseeable. It has to be a foreseeable result of what the state authorized. It can't just be, oh, the state said you could engage in regulation X, and you did that, and it happened to displace competition. There has to be some indication that the state actually, the state, the sovereign actually contemplated that the regulation as enacted by the non-sovereign body would displace competition in the manner, um, manner that it did. So that's how the, the, the state action doctrine had evolved up until, say, 2015. One thing that was really left unclear, and this is why I'm, I'm finally getting to what does this have to do with occupational licensing, is, you know, these occupational licensing boards, again, as Clark had, had, uh, had, has mentioned, who, who are they made up? Who, what, <coughs> who, who comprises them? Well, the, the very people who are being regulated, right? The, the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners, who do you think sits on that? A bunch of practicing dentists. The same thing with the florists and the, and the, the casket maker. They're all industry participants, and they're industry participants for 360 days a year. But those five days that they meet in their regulatory capacity, you know, they put on their hat, but they're still private market participants. Um, and this was, a, this was something that was kind of left unclear in the, <clears throat> as the state action doctrine evolved, is to what extent could the antitrust laws be used to attack these licensing regimes? Because most of them were probably acting pursuant to a clearly articulated state policy. I mean, again, there, it's, I wouldn't concede that, but that's a harder, a harder argument. But one thing probably wasn't true is they weren't being supervised by the state. Uh, and, and it was something, that, again, my time at the FTC, we were quite interested in, bringing, finding a case and, and, and bringing a test case, and we finally found that. North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners. That case, um, as I alluded to, it was dental, uh, uh, a bunch of practicing dentists, and what they said is that teeth whitening, well, that's the practice of dentistry, and so non-dentists can't do teeth whitening. And they, they went through, I, I won't go into the, to, to the case in detail, and, and many of you may be familiar with it, but they sent out cease and desist letters and did everything they could to get non-dentist teeth whiteners out, out of the business of offering teeth whitening uh, services. The case, the FTC brought suit, the case eventually went uh, up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that, indeed, these dentists, this board of dental examiners, should be treated like a collection of private, uh, uh, of, of private dentists, not like a state entity. And, and they would need to be actively supervised. And it turns out they weren't actively supervised. So they had no, no, no immunity. And this is where now we are. And North Carolina, the, the reason I, I wanted to emphasize that case is because that case has really kind of opened up the floodgates now. Because prior to North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners, it seemed, and I think I would, uh, as someone who studied and written on the, the topic, if anything, I mean, there were a few cases that dealt with it, and the, the, uh, and the, I, I would say that maybe the conventional wisdom was well, that, that these boards were likely beyond the reach of the antitrust laws as long as they're acting pursuant to uh, an, a, a clearly articulated state policy. But this, this has now changed everything. We've seen the last couple of years, we've seen the Teladoc case, which we talk about in our paper, which is a suit uh, against the Texas Medical Board that was an attempt to restrict uh, telemedicine. Uh, we've also seen a case against uh, um, uh, the Missouri uh, Taxi Board in uh, dealing with Uber, and also a case in Seattle, which is slightly different, wasn't really occupational licensing. But again, it seems that uh, this has been a real, the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners has been a real catalyst that now antitrust seems to be a viable tool to 
uh, go after these go after these licensing um, regimes. Now there there are several open questions, and maybe we can get into this in the in the in the Q and A uh, left after North Carolina Dental. It's unclear um, what active supervision actually means. That's one thing that would have been teed up in the Teladoc case, you know, just judicial review of a decision. Is that sufficient active supervision? This is something that needs to be, uh, uh, that, that needs to be worked out. I think probably the biggest issue is, assuming you strip a state board of its antitrust uh, defense and its state action defense, that's not the end, the end of it. It just means that we now have a viable antitrust case. We can't just get rid of it. How do you do an antitrust case against a state board where the defenses that a state board is going to use are typically going to be of the health and safety variety? Well, we need to prevent dentists, non-dentists from doing teeth whitening to protect the population from, uh, from, from, uh, you know, from getting their gums burned. Right? That was one of, the, one, of the, one of the justifications. Well, that's a health and safety justification. It may even be valid. Nonetheless, those aren't the kind of justifications that are brought in. The anti antitrust jurisprudence is pretty clear that we care about competition. Non-competition values don't come into the rule of reason calculus. So what does that mean? Can the state board ever really defend their actions in, in an antitrust suit? Now, these are really interesting um, open questions, and I've written on these, so if you are interested, you know, some, I'm kind of doing a little self-promotion here. Go out and read my articles. But what I think is where this is going to, uh, what, I, what I think rather than these antitrust defeating these occupational licensing regimes, say, case by case, um, I'm, and we have a lot of AGs and uh, people who work in the AG offices in the, in the room, from what I understand, from what I hear, is that all this uncertainty is actually, I think, is going to be a catalyst to rethink occupational licensing in general because um, the prospect of defending these board's actions in an antitrust suit after North Carolina Dental, it's an expensive proposition. How do you, do, what do you, what, how are you going to defend them? And then from the, from the larger state, you, you go backwards and you think, okay, maybe the state thinks the risk isn't worth it. Maybe we get out of the business of occupational licensing in this area or this area because we're going to now risk antitrust suit unless we do a lot, you know, have active supervision. What is active supervision? What is that going to mean? It's going to be expensive, whatever it is. Does it mean vertically integrating in the state? So these sort of considerations, again, the threat of the potential threat of antitrust, I think is going to be a very important catalyst in rethinking the occupational licensing schemes in states overall. So I see my time is up, and we'll talk more about this during the panel. But thanks for your time. Thanks, James. Uh, we'll uh, move to Ryan. Thanks very much. Um, I'm delighted to be able to discuss these papers. I think they are extremely thought-provoking documents. Uh, they cover a lot of intellectual ground, uh, so it was particularly interesting to, to uh, get to talk about them. Occupational licensing, as I think has already been mentioned, is, you know, an increasingly, it's increasingly recognized that this is a core labor market uh, institution. And I think it's, it's getting a lot more attention in both the economics, academic economics community and also in the policy discussion. So I think this sort of discussion is really, can be very useful. Uh, because the papers cover so much ground, my comments will also be pretty wide-ranging uh, and from an economist's perspective as opposed to a lawyer's. However, I'm going to focus on a few general themes. First, I'm, I'm not always convinced by either the public choice or the public interest uh, rationales for occupational licensing, and I'll explain the limitations as I see them. And along the way, I'm going to try to talk about what this means for the, the policy discussion as it's actually occurring now. Uh, and then I'll offer a few thoughts about how to situate analysis of occupational licensing within this broader context of economists' concerns uh, about declining labor market competition and declining dynamism. So I think both papers make a really strong case for the relevance of public choice dynamics uh, to the growth of licensing. In many instances, I find that case convincing. But I think there's more going on here than just the rent-seeking by these well-organized, concentrated private interests, the sort of Mansur Olson story and then the associated regulatory capture. In particular, I'm interested in explanations that are not quite the canonical public choice story, but also aren't the public interest story of uh, disinterested regulators, you know, carefully weighing social costs and benefits. 
I'll preface the first alternative explanation by observing that in the simplest story about rent seeking, we have a well-organized group of workers becoming licensed in order to reduce competition, you know, benefiting themselves at the expense of consumers and unlicensed workers. However, it's very common to see something different. We see an arms race between occupations that overlap in the sorts of tasks and services that they perform. This arms race motivates each profession to seek license status. So this can be a defensive measure uh, that simply protects their ability to work because without some statutory acknowledgement, the dominant or the earlier licensed profession is able to exclude the other professions from work that, it's, uh, that they would otherwise be qualified to perform. You know, we see this with athletic trainers and physical therapists, with physicians and nurses, with dentists and dental hygienists, uh, among many others. So these scope of practice concerns are, are important. Um, and I think this is particularly relevant to the North Carolina and other cases that were just discussed. The second explanation is a little bit outside my expertise uh, as an economist, but it's one that I've become convinced is pretty important. So licensed workers and people generally tend to associate the dignity of work with whether it's licensed. I think this is fundamentally mistaken because all honest work has dignity. Licensing should not be thought of as a public recognition of the value uh, of the work done by the, the members of the profession or the social contribution that it makes. Rather, I think licensing, as Clark said, should be thought of as a regulation of last resort that is sometimes necessitated by clear dangers to public health and safety that are, are not remediable through you know, less burdensome types of regulatory policies. So one corollary of this, though, is that licensing skeptics should be careful, I think, not to minimize the importance of some licensed work. So, for example, you know, skeptics often emphasize the differences between medical licensing and other types uh, or compare the surprisingly high number of training days needed for barbers relative to EMTs. That's done in the Neely paper and in many other reports. Um, certainly, I've made that comparison myself, and it, I think it's a useful way of highlighting the variability of licensing and the poor design of many of its rules, as Clark has just explained. But I think it's important to be really clear when talking about this, as I think the Neely paper is, that this is a discussion about optimal regulatory policy and not an argument about the relative value of different sorts of work. But I'm also interested in the strengths and weaknesses of the public interest account of licensure, uh, which the two papers evaluate and find to be unconvincing. I have two points to make, one that's favorable and one that is, that is not. Uh, first, I think it's easy to imagine that consumers over time have become more willing to pay for assurance of safety and quality. So whether they're getting, their underlying risk aversion is increasing or not, I think because they're getting wealthier, it's, it's possible to imagine that you know, they are, are more interested in these assurances and that uh, their representatives you know, could implement that, that change in the form of, of uh, uh, more stringent licensing. So that's, that's one possibility. That's the favorable point. The critical one is the following. The whole basis for the public interest account of licensure is that consumers have imperfect information about the quality and safety of the services that they'd like to purchase. And this is well explained, I think, in both of the papers. But you know, if these things were readily observable, the quality of the services, if, or if online reputational markets were functioning really well, uh, we wouldn't need licensing. And that's, that's explained well in the papers. But you know, most people agree that there are professional contexts where that's not the case. The problem for the public interest story uh, of licensure, though, is that policymakers are in much the same situation that consumers are. Mm -hmm. And I think we see this in their reliance on occupational licensing boards that consist largely or entirely of the professionals themselves. Uh, and we also see it in the extreme deference that courts give to arguments that licensing is necessary to ensure public safety. So my experience is that licensing advocates sometimes exploit the fact that it's hard to evaluate claims about public safety risks. Uh, and legislatures and courts are reluctant to say that they're wrong. One related tendency uh, is that a, a plausible or even a compelling argument about a public health or safety risk for a particular task that is performed by a, a professional is then deployed as justification for the whole licensing scheme. You might argue, you know, you, for example, you might agree that cosmetologists should be trained in the use of potentially dangerous chemicals, but this doesn't imply that you know, more than a year of, of training is required, much of that training presumably not related to the, that particular health and safety concern. So now I'd like to, to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about whether, you know, away from talking about whether and how licensing is justified 
and turn to some of the economic costs of licensing that I think get less attention than they should, either in, in these papers or more generally. And the first concerns worker mobility. Uh, and I think the papers spent a little less time on this than they might. Uh, it's become really clear that state, the state level licensing system as it's set up is a real impediment to geographic mobility. You can see this in data that I've looked at, you know, comparing licensed and unlicensed workers. They move within state at about the same rate, but the licensed workers are much less likely to move across state because doing so necessitates their relicensure, which is costly to them. There's some new research by Johnson and Morris Kleiner that, uh, you know, that establishes this in a more rigorous fashion. And I think this is a real problem for an economy that is already suffering from diminished dynamism uh, of many kinds, including diminished geographic mobility, uh, diminished entrepreneurship, diminished job switching. And you know, the economics profession uh, in particular has become really concerned with this in recent years, and there's a lot of good work showing that this matters for uh, our economic and, and technological progress. But it's a problem that in principle could be solved without actually affecting the rents that licensed workers are getting. So it, it actually, if you're convinced by the public choice account, I think you should be pretty optimistic about the prospects for addressing this sort of interstate problem. And then the other type of licensing burden that I'm worried about is, is much harder to quantify um, and gets little attention in the academic literature because of that. But I think both of these papers that we're talking about do a tremendous job of uh, illustrating this, what I'm about to talk about. The issue is the dynamic cost of licensing. So consider a state practice act that was written in the 1970s for some particular profession. It's gonna embody assumptions about how work is conducted and how it's organized in that profession. And both the practice act and the licensing board that it empowers are gonna be circumscribed by those assumptions that were made potentially many decades ago. And when technological and market innovation opens up new opportunities to organize work in, in better and more efficient ways, you know, as happens with ride sharing, with the Teladoc case discussed in James' paper, the entrepreneur described in Clark's paper who took on the, the California Pest Control Board, and many other instances, I think licensing institutions can really stifle the deployment of these innovations, whether they're straightforward technological innovations or changes in business practices. So I'll conclude by saying that I worry most about that sort of cost. Uh, sadly, you know, the economy is full of destructive rent seeking and we should try to expose and eliminate it, but I suspect that the worst harms are those that we struggle to measure because the entrepreneurs were prevented from um, introducing the, the innovation in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Greg Conco and the members of the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy for inviting me here today. Um, it's been a pleasure listening to the earlier panels, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss two important papers on a subject that I care a lot about, uh, occupational licensing. Uh, just by way of background, I worked at the Council of Economic Advisors from 2014 to 2016, uh, and together with Ryan, was part of a larger team at CEA, uh, the National Economic Council, the Labor Department, and the Treasury Department that developed a report on occupational licensing, which was released in 2015. Um, and as part of the process of writing that report, we had a lot of conversations with state legislators, uh, professional associations, academics, and regulators who work on licensing. And one aspect of that experience that I found particularly heartening was that although people had a range of different perspectives on this issue, there was, for the most part, a shared agreement that the current system just wasn't working very well for too many workers and consumers. And we found a shared willingness to consider alternative approaches. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the spirit of academic discourse, rather than emphasizing all the areas of consensus on this issue, I thought it might make for a more interesting conversation today to point to a few possible areas of disagreement. Uh, public choice theory has long been the dominant lens through which economists and other scholars have viewed occupational licensing. Uh, this is for a good reason. Uh, public choice theory, which posits that political officials uh, 
are primarily motivated by their own material self-interest helps to explain several features of the licensure system that are difficult to understand from any other perspective. Uh, for example, as both James Cooper and Clark Neely convincingly argue in their papers, the extraordinary amount of variation in licensing requirements at the state level is difficult to account for if the primary purpose of licensing is to promote the public interest or to correct a market failure. Uh, public choice theory also helps to explain why licensing laws have proliferated in recent decades and why they've been so resilient in the face of numerous calls for reform over the years. Uh, nevertheless, although the public choice account of licensing is useful, I also believe that it has limitations which have been underappreciated. In these remarks, I want to briefly emphasize three potential drawbacks in particular, which I think complement some of the points that Ryan has just made. In doing so, I hope to plant some seeds of doubt about the standard public choice account of licensing and to make the case for a more nuanced perspective that draws on this theory without adopting it wholesale. Uh, first, in the words of Professor Tyler Cowen, uh, we should be suspicious of simple stories. Uh, to be sure, practitioners likely often seek new licensing requirements out of their own pecuniary self-interest. Yet, we should not completely discount other possible explanatory factors. Uh, for instance, as Ryan has just pointed out, workers may sometimes seek licensing out of a desire for increased legitimacy and cultural authority. Uh, alternatively, they may sometimes do so in order to enhance the level of quality within a profession. Uh, and these motivating factors may be difficult to disentangle, and multiple factors may be at play in any given instance. So for example, although historians have written several treatises on the origins of medical licensure, there still is no clear historical consensus as to whether regular allopathic physicians initially sought licensure primarily to enhance their own market power over competing medical schools, or whether they did so to improve quality by driving out low quality practitioners. Uh, some scholars have embraced a combination of these theories. Moreover, although there's a dearth of evidence that licensure improves quality, the existing evidence does not preclude the possibility that some licensing restrictions do enhance quality and protect public safety. So as Clark Neely and his co-authors have astutely acknowledged, much of the empirical research in this area has focused on evaluating incremental differences in licensing standards. So we cannot conclude from this evidence alone that abolishing licensing altogether would not have a negative impact on quality or public safety. Moreover, as Neely's paper points out, some studies that focus on the initial adoption of licensing laws, rather than on evaluating contemporary licensing restrictions, have found that they did lead to quality improvements. Uh, in Daniel Carpenter and David Moss's book on regulatory capture, they suggest that there may be a middle ground between the public choice account of regulation and the public interest view. Carpenter and Moss define weak capture as, quote, when special interest influence compromises the capacity of regulation to enhance the public interest, but the public is still being served by regulation relative to the baseline of no regulation. Uh, it is possible then that even when practitioners seek licensing out of a desire to enhance their own market power or skew licensing restrictions in anti-competitive ways, that there are at least some instances in which the public is better off with some licensing than with none. Second, the public choice account of licensing tends to place disproportionate emphasis on those professions for which the public interest account is least plausible, rather than on those where there is a stronger justification for licensing. In doing so, however, this view ironically may overlook some of the most harmful consequences of licensing. Proponents of the public choice account often tend to focus on licensing requirements for relatively small lower wage professions, such as horse masseurs or florists, since to many people it seems intuitively implausible that such professions pose enough of a danger to public safety to merit licensure. For the same reason, the predominance of the public choice view has, in my view, led to less emphasis being placed on traditionally licensed professions, such as medicine, for which even some of the most fervent critics of licensing 
concede that the justification for licensing is stronger. This emphasis is arguably misplaced, however, since licensing regimes in traditionally licensed fields such as medicine and law have some of the most harmful consequences for workers and consumers. As I argue in other work, several features of the licensure system for healthcare providers restrict access to healthcare for patients without improving the quality of care being delivered. For instance, so-called scope of practice restrictions prevent healthcare providers such as nurse practitioners or dental hygienists from offering services to the full extent of their competency. State-specific licensing requirements obstruct the adoption of telehealth by requiring that healthcare providers be separately licensed in each state in which their patients are located, or by requiring face-to-face -face consultations. In addition, licensing requirements deter foreign trained providers from practicing in the United States by requiring them to complete costly and often duplicative training and testing. Similarly, the licensure regime for legal practitioners has contributed to a system in which a staggering number of people are unable to afford legal representation, even when they are facing serious consequences such as eviction, foreclosure, or imprisonment. In New York State in 2010, 98% of tenants in eviction cases and 95% of parents in child support cases were not represented by a, by a lawyer. And in Los Angeles, up to 80% of people in landlord, tenant, and family cases went unrepresented. These points are especially important because although the expansion of licensing into previously unlicensed fields is certainly striking and worth noting, many licensed workers today still work in traditionally licensed fields such as healthcare and law. Uh, data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics suggests that healthcare practitioners alone account for around 20% of licensed workers in the United States. All this is not to say that public choice analysis cannot be applied to licensing regimes in more traditional fields, nor that all proponents of the public choice account are guilty of ignoring these fields. To the contrary, both of the papers presented today focus in part on these fields and do so from a public choice perspective. Nevertheless, I worry that many accounts of licensing tend to de-emphasize these areas in part because they don't fit as neatly into the public choice story. To the extent that this is, a case, this, this is the case, the public choice account risks distracting from some of the most detrimental consequences of licensing. Finally, the public choice account implies that get, getting rid of licensing altogether is the primary way to reform licensing, even in the face of evidence that supports less radical reforms. Deregulation is the natural implication of public choice theory. If licensing mainly exists to enhance practitioners' market power, and if there's no legitimate public interest rationale, then why not get rid of licensing altogether? Yet many of the costs of licensing appear to depend not on licensing per se, but on how specific licensing requirements are structured. For instance, uh, both Neely and Cooper rightly point to specific aspects of licensing regimes such as restrictions on telemedicine and scope of practice requirements, which limit competition without providing accompanying quality benefits. Recent research by Jana Johnson and Morris Kleiner finds that workers in occupations that have state-specific licensing exams are less willing to move across state lines than unlicensed workers, but that workers in, the, in occupations with national licensing exams are just as mobile as unlicensed workers. Such findings suggest that many of the harms of licensing are not intrinsic to licensing itself, and thus that some of these harms can be alleviated by reforming licensing without getting rid of it altogether. The Obama White House's 2015 report laid out a number of best practices toward that end, including promoting the appointment of public representatives to licensing boards, harmonizing licensing requirements to the maximum extent possible across states, and limiting entry requirements to those that specifically address legitimate public health and safety concerns. Of course, there is a strong case for subjecting licensure laws to greater scrutiny, and there may be professions for which the costs of licensure clearly outweigh the benefits. Yet, in other cases, uh, perhaps in many cases, the cost-benefit analysis will be less clear. Moreover, as Clark Neely and his co-authors discuss in their paper, it has historically proven quite difficult to get rid of licensing laws altogether.
Uh, thus, it's important to keep in mind that changes in how a profession is licensed and not just whether it is licensed can result in tangible improvements to the lives of workers and consumers. Thanks. Thank you, Gabe. Um, before we get into a free-flowing discussion, um, I thought I'd give an opportunity to Clark and James if they wanted to respond. Oh. Uh, well, I guess uh, you know, it almost seems like a love fest up here. So uh, I don't have. Uh, I was. I was. I was hoping for some more virulent criticism, but uh, um, I'll. I, I. What I would. I, the only. The only response, and again, this isn't. Uh, I, I don't think there was anything really necessarily critical. Is I. I would actually. Um, I think agree in large part with some of the stuff that Gabe said um, with respect to uh, you know scope of practice restrictions things like that. I mean, I my my view, and I think a lot of this is informed from my work at the at the FTC, is that I think the bigger mischief of these um, licensing boards isn't necessarily so much the licensing regime. I mean, there is that. Let's, why do we license florists? You know, there's certainly entry restriction there, but it's the regulations that that these regimes pass that tend to incrementally uh, diminish competition. I mean, the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners is a, is a great, those are scope of practice restrictions to say, okay, here's what dentists, here's what, it, you, what if you, what you can do, uh, if you're doing this, you need to be a dentist, you know, and, and just keeps incrementally expanding that. I think that those, uh, um, another area you'd mentioned, uh, the, the legal profession, I think that's definitely one uh, a lot of states uh, require you to have a lawyer to close, uh, to do a real estate closing. I mean, again, that's, that's part of a larger licensing regime, but by the same token, it's another scope of practice restriction. So I think that, that in, 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 in my view, that it's, it's the, the, the little, the, the regulations, another one I'll, I'll, I'll mention, uh, something we worked on at the FTC, the uh, Texas Real Estate Commission, back when we were there starting to do online, uh, when, when um, online real estate uh, uh, sales is becoming a, uh, e-commerce is starting to, to get a little more sophisticated in the early 2000s, and, and they were th these online brokers were getting in business, and uh, basically it's a for sale by owner that say, I'll put you in the MLS, and um, I will list you on uh, my website, and you'll be in the MLS. And, and uh, the Texas Real Estate Commission, along with some other states, uh, Alabama, I think Tennessee, were, um, were, were going to uh, enact, thinking about enacting, again, under the, the licensing regime, the Texas Real Estate Commission, not surprisingly, who, who sits on the Texas Real Estate Commission, a bunch of real estate brokers, right? And they said, well, um, we don't like these internet guys that are charging, you know, $500 uh, as opposed to our 6% commission. So let's um, pass a rule that says if you're going to list a house, you have to do everything. You have to show it. You have to do, you know, so uh, basically taking away the for sale by, by owner model. Again, that's not the licensing of real estate broker. We can argue about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing to have licensing in the real estate brokerage industry, but there it's just an incremental regulation. Let's restrict comp let's get together, put our T-Rec hats on. Um, we're licensed brokers most of the year, but we'll put our T-Rec state hats on and then keep this innovative business model out, out of the marketplace. Um, so, so in that respect, I kind of agree, agree with you. Um, uh, you know, there's the big picture question of do we need licensing? Do we need some sort of state assurance of quality? Um, then there's, well, we have these boards that restrict competition through discrete regulation, and I think that's where more, more of the mischief is, so, anyway. Um, so I, <clears throat> I, am I the only lawyer on the panel? I think I am. Uh, I, oh, two lawyers, sorry. So, so speaking for the two of us, I would say. Your presentation was about the state action. <laughs> well, you don't need to know law to know that. You know, yeah, that's a, <laughs> according, according to the dissent in North Carolina Dental, that didn't have anything to do with law. That would be practice of law. Let's right. talk about that. Well, and so here's my point is I, I don't understand why uh, we should stop with um, uh, real estate closings. I think you should have to have a lawyer represent you for any legal document. You know, if you sign a rental car contract or a lease, uh, I don't think you should be able to download a new operating system on your phone without consulting with a lawyer. I think, you know, we're, <laughs> consumers are massively underprotected, really, when you think about it. So um, I'm joking, of course. Uh, so I think I, 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 I really, again, I, I'm, I join you in, in sort of not really uh, disagreeing agreeing uh, with anything that's been presented, but I do want to emphasize, uh, I think, one point that's really important. Uh, uh, the idea that um, I agree that, that sometimes we just 
it's difficult to know how the cost benefit shakes out. I agree with that. And it's just, um, uh, you know, reasonable minds can differ. So I think it's extraordinarily important to have the right default setting. And by that I mean that we have to, um, uh, what would be better than what we have now is if we um, got the default in the right place. Right now the default is that if somebody wants to regulate your productive activity and they can convince some, uh, you know, legislator, I don't want to name any states, but let's say a not particularly sophisticated legislate, legislator to um, enact that law, then you don't get to practice in that occupation unless you meet all of the requirements. That is, that's putting the default in exactly the wrong place. The default in this country should be that you get to engage in productive activity unless somebody can show to some reasonable degree of likelihood that there would be a genuine problem for that. And the good news here is it's actually not impossible to do this, or it's not impossible, it's, it's, it's not a crazy place to set the default. Um, as I think both of our reports document, uh, there are only about 50 or 60 vocations that are regulated in every state, and the vast majority of them, something over 1,000, maybe even 1,100 vocations that are licensed um, in at least one state, are only licensed in a handful of states. And what that enables us to do is to compare jurisdictions that do not regulate the vocation, like interior design or floristry, um, with ones that do. And if there are no problems or no significant problems for consumers in the non-regulating jurisdictions, then that should increase, I think, the burden of proof on those who would impose licensing uh, even higher. Um, because we have an opportunity to see how the cost benefit shakes out. They've not been able to document any costs from non-licensing, and so that, that should add to their burden of proof. Uh, I want to end by heaping some discredit on an institution that hasn't uh, really been focused on as much as it should and richly deserves it, and that's the US Supreme Court. The US Supreme Court has made an absolute hash out of this point. Uh, what the Supreme Court did was it said there is a constitutional right to earn a living, but it's meaningless. By which I mean the government can defeat it by going into court and making things up and literally just asserting false justifications for its laws. And I'll give you one example. I, was, I litigated that Florida interior design case. One of the arguments that the state of Louisiana made in support of its interior design licensing was, no kidding, the physical dangers of unlicensed floristry. There are none. But they made up things like misplaced corsage pins and infected dirt. <laughs> ah, you laugh, but guess where those ended up? In the judge's opinion that upheld that law. And that leaves me wondering, is this guy so unsophisticated that he just fell off of some turnip truck and thinks you could actually get injured by a misplaced corsage pin? Or is he so cynical that he, has, that he thinks he has to pretend? to believe that any of that could be true. And unfortunately, I think the latter is true. I think the, the Supreme Court has instructed lower court judges to pretend to believe that which no serious person would believe. And they've turned the courts into a completely non-serious forum for, for trying to vindicate your right to earn a living. And guess who takes their cue from the utter non-seriousness of litigation over occupational freedom? State legislators. They see how completely unserious it is in the courts and the kinds of ridiculous explanations that the that judges will, will, will uh, rubber stamp without any hesitation, and they follow their lead. That has been a disaster uh, for occupational freedom in this country. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions I had, and this is really open to everybody, is one of the claims made by those who are against occupational licensing, and perhaps validly, is that there's a dynamic consequence, an innovative effect, that it hurts innovation in these occupations. And one thing is, um, What's the mechanism of that harm from innovation? Because coming from an antitrust background, it's, ambiv you know, it's, it's unclear which way the innovation goes, whether you're a monopolist or competition. Very often we think more competition means more innovation. But the literature is, is very ambiguous on that. So I was just um, sort of wondering why, within occupational licensing, we can make that claim, or um, what's different? Happy to kind of say something quickly. Um, I, I think that it's not so much what I'm worried about is not so much the incremental reduction in the number of workers who are in the profession because of the barrier to entry. So, uh, you know, there is an argument to be made there that the diminished competition would, would have the effects through that channel on innovation. But it's more that the, the way that you go about working in the profession is 
you know, to some extent laid down in statute or is then, you know, uh, prescribed by the licensing board. So it's, you know, in some cases you've got entrepreneurs that have kind of thumbed their noses at the, at the licensing restrictions. They've then demonstrated that there's a way, a better way to organize um, activity. I'm thinking of ride sharing, and, but there are many others. Uh, and I, I just, I wonder, and it's really one of these things that's hard to know, the counterfactual is very, is hard to see, you know, how many um, potentially innovative practices have just, we've never seen, you know, because the licensing system sort of put in place a, a, a overly codified and, and too strict a, a sense of, you know, how work should happen. I, I, I'm sorry, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Um. And I think I know what you're, you're, you're getting at that, you know, John, I mean, just from an economic standpoint, I mean, empirically, there's no it, relationship. I mean, uh, a monopolist may actually be able to capture more of the return from innovation, so there can be incentives there. I mean, the information is a public good. Um, and, but by the same token, competition on that, uh, on that dimension uh, can actually lead to more, more innovation. And as, an empirical, as a theoretical and an empirical question, is actually unsolved in economics. So, um, uh, which, yeah. But I think the distinction with the occupational licensing would be that the licensing, and so actually, rather than the innovation problem stemming from a reduction in you know, monopoly versus competition, it's that the licensing regime actually outlaws the innovative practice de facto, so, um, or de jure. I mean, in, in the sense, so I use the Texas Regula the Real Estate Commission as an example. Here's a new innovative business model. Let's put houses up online. Let's let homeowners now kind of, let's kind of unbundle the service and now let homeowners, if they want to sell it on their own, do it. We'll put you in the MLS and we'll put you on a website. You do everything else and we'll charge you a lot less than 6%. Um, that's an innovative business model, but it was going to be it wasn't that the innovation, it, it wasn't the typical economic argument of monopoly versus competition. It was the law, the regulation would have outlawed that model in the same way that the regulation would outlaw ride sharing. So it's a direct outlawing of the, the innovative practice. So cool. Um, one question I had also is um, some of the cases that, particularly Clark, that you mentioned, they seem so obvious wins. Now you've litigated a number <laughs> of cases and um, you know, and I know Ryan and Gabe, you guys for your report also looked at a lot of cases and, and what are the arguments that are persuasive to the judge, right or wrong? Why are they winning? Why is this not a route for getting rid of really crazy op occupational licensing? So I, I, as a former economic liberty litigator, let me say, uh, the, it's important to, to, to understand the seen and the unseen. So what, what basically happens is organizations like the Institute for Justice, where I used to work, or Goldwater, Pacific Legal, are extraordinarily selective in the cases that they bring. And they nevertheless have maybe a, they're batting about 300, if that. So it, what you're seeing essentially is, is the, the, the product of some extraordinarily sharp people who are being very, very selective, and they're still losing more than 50% of their cases. Um, and so the fact of the matter is, um, is, is that, yes, these can be won, but it basically you have to kind of get the right mix of judges. Um, usually you end up, you know, the case usually ends with a particular appellate panel. So just to give you an example, the Institute for Justice up until uh, uh, just this last year never lost an African hair braiding case. These are cases involving a practice of braiding African hair. There's a lot of states where you're not allowed to do that unless you're a fully licensed cosmetologist, which um, in most states takes even longer to become than a, a lawyer. Um, but we, uh, we, the Institute for Justice, where I was until last summer, uh, lost their first case in Missouri, and it went up on appeal. And the Eighth Circuit's opinion affirming this loss in the district court is just its textbook judicial deference, um, up to and including uh, more or less applauding the lower court judge who invented his own justifications for the law that the government didn't even assert. Um, not for nothing, but that's actually improper in litigation, but the Supreme Court has instructed lower courts to essentially act as Article III co-counsel for the government in these cases by inventing justification. So on the one hand, I think the cases can be won in large measure because the Supreme Court is so obviously wrong 
in saying that the right to earn a living is not fundamental. Of course it's fundamental. In fact, it'd be hard to imagine a more fundamental right than that in this country. Um, it's, it's frankly one of the things we fought the revolution over. So the Supreme Court was, was manifestly wrong um, in granting second class status to the right of occupational freedom. So that's why some cases are won, but the doctrine is very much still stacked against challenges, which is why most cases are lost. Can I, can I actually, I want to ask you, you a question, Clark, since this is an area. I mean, and, and I guess what you're getting at is just the, the notion and the rational basis review, which all of these, these are 14th Amendment cases, you're bringing in their, their rational basis review, which is extraordinarily deferential and even allows you to have ex post rationalization, right? I mean, do you see uh, any change in that jurisprudence? Because I think there, there have been a couple cases where I, I th uh, I'm trying to think of the paper, Doug Ginsburg and, and somebody else, a rational basis with bite or yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Do you see any, any traction in that? Uh? Uh, I do. So those who don't know, the rational basis test is the default setting, um, the default standard review in constitutional cases, and it's a charade and a fraud. Um, just <laughs> so you know. Um, and the question is whether there's been movement. And I think there has actually. So one of the most important, I would say actually the most important economic liberty decision that I'm aware of is a concurring opinion by Don Willett when he was a Texas Supreme Court justice. He's just recently been confirmed to the Fifth Circuit um, in a case that the Institute for Justice brought involving um, the people who use a piece of string to remove eyebrow hair. It's called threading. Uh, and the lower court's we lost the way you usually lose. Just no, no judge wanted to get involved. Just, well, the state says this is, this is important, so it must be important. Uh, but we got to the Texas Supreme Court uh, and won six to three, and the, the winning opinion was very, you know, pretty narrow, and okay, they barely win. But Justice Willett wrote a concurrence that was a full-throated defense of economic liberty and a rejection of knee-jerk deference and an embrace of the so-called Lochner era. He has a whole footnote, a page-long footnote, rejecting this sort of, you know, anti-Lochnerism. So, um, so not only was it a very good opinion, but um, you may remember that within a couple of years of writing that opinion. First of all, it, it really propelled uh, Justice Willett, then Justice Willett, into sort of rock star status within the conservative movement. His name appeared on uh, Trump's shortlist for Supreme Court. If you had said to somebody five years ago that the person who wrote the most full-throated defense of economic liberty ever written in America that embraced Lochner as opposed to rejecting it would show up on a, on a, president's, on a Republican president's shortlist for Supreme Court within two years, we'd have said you were nuts. So one swallow does not a summer make, but I don't think that's an accident either. I might uh, just, if I could go back to a, a question that you asked a moment ago um, as to, you know, or it, there seems to be a sense that, you know, there's a lot of agreement on this panel and perhaps in the broader uh, economic policy community about these issues. I, I just wanted to say a couple things about that. One is I think that there is, uh, there's agreement in part because licensing has gone to it. The rules are suboptimal to an extent that kind of brings uh, people of disparate views together in thinking that there are a set of problems. But I do think that, you know, if, um, if we were to sort of talk about which costs we find most important, uh, you know, we would emphasize different things. I suspect that the actual solutions, you know, the policy solutions that we would want to implement um, we would probably put different emphasis on those. So I, I suspect that while there's consensus about the, the existence of at least some very serious problems, there's a lot less about you know, what you should do about it. Yeah, just, just to add to that, um, I think one uh, other possible area of disagreement is the remedy, what, what we should do about the, the current system. And for myself, I'm pretty wary of the types of uh, constitutional claims that Clark was just mentioning. And I think other kind of um, uh, people outside of the conservative movement tend to be more wary of those claims in general because um, both because there's the feeling that courts aren't particularly institutionally well equipped to second guess the policy decisions of, of legislatures and agencies and also this, this fear that um, vindicating these types of decisions in the licensing context um, will give rise to other types of uh, constitutional litigations uh, against other forms of, of regulation. Um, for myself, I, I would prefer an approach in which the, uh, you know, litigation was a, a tool and antitrust is a tool to, to curb the most, um, to curb uh, instances in which licensing is clearly being used in anti-competitive ways and has no rational uh, public health or safety justification. 
but that I also think the federal government has other tools at its disposal to uh, encourage states to uh, rethink and reform their own licensing practices. So we've seen a, a couple recent steps that I think are somewhat encouraging. Um, the Labor Department recently awarded a grant to the National Conference of State Legislatures to work with a, a consortium of uh, states to uh, increase portability and limit barriers to entry. Um, the, the VA, interestingly, has um, some regulatory authority over uh, healthcare providers who work there, and they recently expanded their uh, scope of practice rules for advanced practice nurses. So I, I think certainly antitrust is an important tool, but it's not, it's not the only one that the federal government has. So um, I wanted to leave an opportunity for the audience, if there's questions out there, to go ahead and ask the panel. Yeah, right there. I have a question that if you would prefer that this be deferred to the next panel, I understand. But the question is, as I recall, either OSHA or EPA has a regulation in the last couple of years that requires house painters and handymen to go and take a special class to determine if there's lead in the paint when they're doing any type of patching of wallboard. And when I asked a handyman had he had this class, not because I believed it was right or wrong, I was just curious. He said, are you kidding me? In the state of Virginia, it requires that I take two days off work and a half day to travel down to Richmond and I can't take the class online. I can't, you know, there's, the, it's not done at the local county level. I have to go all the way to Richmond. I've just been curious if this type of regulation disturbs you for the same reason you've talked about some of the arbitrary or capricious or, or uh, inexplicable uh, requirements like you did with the florists or the other organization, the realtors or whatever. Do you see this? And who is advocating on behalf of those very small businesses that have a tough time? You know, who's advocating for handymen, right? I mean, I'll just say really quickly, I think that's a great instance of Gabe's point that, you know, it's not always about whether or not an occupation is licensed. It's about particular, you know, what the requirements are and whether they're well targeted to the public health and safety concerns. I'm um, right up front here. Hey, I have a question for the whole panel. Um, can you just uh, apply your expertise and experience with occupational licensing to the one area that almost everyone in this room must endure, which is K-12 education? Yeah. Um, can, maybe you could help us by being a little more specific. It's not clear what the connection is. With teacher licensure. Well, there's not really teacher licensure. There's teacher certification, and that's generally required in public schools. But it is um, not permissible, to my knowledge, and maybe I'm wrong about this, please correct me, but generally speaking, um, a, you cannot prevent somebody from teaching someone else. There's a First Amendment issue there. Now, you can require that someone have a certain certification in order to confer a degree or whatever it might be, but um, if we're talking about teacher certification, which is certainly the most widespread occupational limit on teaching, that's part of a much bigger public policy, which is the, the manner in which we deliver public education. And I think of it really more as a public ed education or, or, or you know, an issue of government provided education more than an occupational issue, although I recognize that it's both. One thing I would just add to that is I, we, there's some good evidence from uh, uh, the economist Dan Goldhaber that teachers uh, you know, move across states, again, you know, at much lower rates mm. than you would otherwise expect. That it's the system, you know, not just the credentialing, but also the pension system and other things sort of conspire to, to make it very difficult uh, for them to move. And that can be a particular problem, um, and this is something the Obama administration looked at, uh, it can be a particular problem for spouses of uh, active military, right? Because uh, many of them are teachers and uh, moving across states uh, often leads them to exit the labor force instead of continuing to work. Mm -hmm. 
I see a question right there in the middle, right there. Thank you. I'm Todd Gaziano from the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is one of the institutions that Clark mentioned that brings these economic liberty cases. And like uh, Clark, uh, understandably, I, I agree that the real hope is to get some teeth into rational basis or better to, to even out the, um, the, the proper level of deference. Uh, maybe I'll invite him to uh, address uh, Gabe's point that judges are competent to to second guess, uh, scrutinize certain fundamental liberties and not others. But my other point related was that one area that uh, my colleagues at Pacific Legal Foundation have concentrated on to create a crack in the rational basis dike that, that I want to get your opinion, because I think it's analogous to the Supreme Court's holding in the North Carolina Dental, is there's an aspect of some of the uh, licensing uh, schemes uh, in some states that we've gone after that um, uh, uh, asks incumbents, the state process asks incumbents uh, whether there's a need for some new competitor who's applying. And uh, we challenged that successfully in court in Kentucky for movers. Uh, we call it the competitor's veto aspect. And we don't challenge the other in that litigation, the other aspects of the cra crazy state licensing bull, uh, scheme that sometimes is, is probably not necessary too. Uh, we got West Virginia uh, changed by legislature, <laughs> one of the, preventing a, a court rule. But I see that as fitting the exception to the, the exception because the, these competitor veto aspects of the licensing scheme um, uh, essentially ask existing incumbents whether they want another competitor and then the state board ratifies whatever their answer is. Um, oh, go ahead, Clark. Well, so just really quickly, these are certificate of need laws uh, in essence and, and the Institute for Justice had a particularly you know, edifying case here in Virginia. The way these work is that if, if you, uh, in the medical field, for example, if you want to open a new facility or, or purchase a significant new piece of equipment like an MRI machine, um, you have to apply to the state and then the state says to all of the other providers in that area, do you think this person should be able to do this? The original rationale was that they may be still paying off their own facilities or paying off their own MRI and, and by introducing another one in the same area, it'll you know, diminish the amount of money they have to pay it off. Um, this is a kooky kind of command and control era rationale that sort of went, on, went by the boards, I think, in the 70s maybe, I, you know, and, and very few states, it was the case that the feds basically forced the states to do this, and now they can do it at their option. Most states have taken it off the books. But just to give you one concrete example that um, for those of us closing in on 50 may have particular poignancy, um, if, if you're going to get a colonoscopy anytime soon, uh, IJ represented a doctor who had to come up with a way of doing that virtually. Essentially, you drink a particular you know, um, substance, and then they can image the colon with an MRI. Um, the state of Virginia invited a bunch of uh, other Virginia facilities, none of whom were offering that service with their MRIs, but offered them the opportunity to come in and say whether they thought it was a good idea to let this man, this doctor, acquire an MRI machine to do that service. They said, nope, not a good idea. So that service won't be provided in Northern Virginia. And to a certainty, some people won't get this procedure done who ought to have had it done. And there will probably be some deaths. And no one will be held responsible or accountable for that. And I think that's quite tragic. And that's a cost. That's a cost. There was a question. I got you next. There's a question right at the end. Hello, uh, Michael Nelson from the Washington State Attorney General's Office. Uh, we're, we're a little bit of a liberal state, so obviously I think that the, that um, you know rational basis is a fraud. No, so. <laughs> but uh, no, no, no. But the serious question I have is is um, there's sort of a lot of talk about the sort of anomalous and disparate treatment of different industries in different states, right? And how it's kind of silly, if you will, to have, you know, uh, so much more training for haircutting in Idaho and stuff like that. And, and I ask this question because the Federalist Society is listed on the front of the pamphlet, which is, isn't that what's supposed to happen? You know, is it, you know, under federalism, isn't it supposed to be that the states experiment and some states just do it really badly? I remember, I didn't say silly, I said suspicious. <laughs> and what we're suspicious about is whether the state is in fact attempting to exercise a constitutionally permissible 
power that it has. The states have the power to protect public health and safety, but if they're pretending to invoke that power while actually trying to advance the selfish economic interests of, of you know, market competitors, I don't believe that's a constitutional power that states have. And so what we try to do in constitutional litigation is to suss out which one is really going on. And I would agree, by the way, if it's a close call, I have no problem with the state with the court saying, yeah, it's too close to call. In cases like Florida's interior design law and in Louisiana's florist licensing and a bunch of others I could list, it's not a close call. The only way you can you, the only way you can say it's a close call is if you're just pretending. So I really think I agree with you, but I think it's about not about recognizing there are limits on the state's ability to experiment, and when they're doing so in good faith, that's totally fine. When they're not, it's not. Yeah, just, just to add to that, um, uh, another sort of indication that the, the variation that we see isn't just a result of differing state preferences is that there tends to be this kind of ratcheting up of, uh, in terms of what professions, professions are licensed over time. So it's, it's pretty rare that a profession ever gets delicensed once it's licensed. And uh, over time, you know, the, there may be only a few states in which profession X is licensed, but over time, the other states tend to license that too. One thing I'll add to that is that um, something I, I worry about uh, is that our preferred solution in many instances is voluntary certification, you know, as opposed to licensing. But the process, that, you know, the political process of organizing the, the workers in the profession lays the groundwork and the infrastructure for, for, for then getting licensed. So it's, it's a very short step politically from one to the other, even though there's worlds of economic difference between a regime that you know, prohibits you from working without the credential and one that just says, now you have a right to title. If only there were some check. We could, we could call it a check on that process. Uh, just, just to add one, one more thing. Uh, I think, so what, one, uh, uh, in response to the idea that there should be this check, one, one policy uh, proposal that we recommended in this uh, report was that um, states should have sunrise commissions. Okay. So right now, I think the way the licensing process often works is that a professional association will come to the state legislature and you know, present some somewhat plausible rationale for why their profession has public health and safety risks. And the state legislatures often who don't you know, have that much time on their hands, don't know that much about the particular area, will say that seems reasonable and we should we'll go ahead and license it. It doesn't even, it usually doesn't cost anything to the state government either since uh, licenses are actually revenue generating. Um, but uh, from, from talking to states, it seemed like uh, sunrise commissions in which there's actually an agency who will uh, take this proposal, evaluate it, um, describe to the legislatures what the costs and benefits of, of licensing this new profession would be. Um, in some cases, uh, reduced the amount of licensing. So we, we pointed to um, the state of Maine, which has had a Sunrise Commission in place for a long time, and I forget the exact statistic, but they, they hadn't licensed very many new professions in the recent years. Uh, thank you for fitting me in. All right, this may be a little beyond your expertise, so feel free to respond in stunned silence, if it is. But obviously, you've had to speak to the medical profession as a big piece, and healthcare generally as a big piece of the licensing puzzle. And that profession stands out, I think, from anything else you've mentioned, in that the economics of it threatened to put the entire country into the economic abyss. I wonder if in your study or your awareness of what's going on in healthcare, obviously there's a very, very tight barrier to entry on becoming a doctor through the number of medical schools and the rest of it. Do you feel a, there is a brewing press just by economic pressure to be changing that scope of services, to be moving more down to the nurse practitioners, to the nurses, just as a way of, you know, avoiding a, uh, or dealing with this significant problem that we have in the country in terms of cost of health care? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you're, you're probably right. I mean, I can speak from my experience at the FTC. FTC, I said we do, we, I, I haven't worked here in a while, but the, 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 the FTC uh, does competition advocacy in one area I think that they, they were innovative in was getting involved in the, these licensing schemes that keep nurse practitioners, you know, from the minute clinics or whatever in CVS. And 
there's been a lot of push there, at least early on, to, to, to stop those, that those would be bad for consumers. And, and the FTC was instrumental, I think, in, I mean, they weren't the only attribute, they were, they were on the scene pretty early. And one of the justifications is exactly that, that, hey, I mean, healthcare costs are going, going through the roof. It's a huge driver of a lot of societal ills. And, and it goes to something that, 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 that Clark mentioned about the colonoscopy. Um, I think which, which have lost a lot in these regulatory schemes is, um, you know, demand curves slope down. Mm -hmm. So when you increase the price of anything, it doesn't mean that, okay, now we've increased the quality and the price, and so everyone will get this higher quality colonoscopy or physical. What that means is that some people aren't going to get it. And, and that's what policymakers tend to forget. And, and the same thing with the Minna Clinic or the colonoscopy. We did a lot, of, the FTC did a lot of work in optometry, which is n not the life and death, th death thing like uh, colonoscopy, but the same idea. If you make it more expensive to get an eye exam, to get contact lenses, if you make it more expensive to go get a physical or an immunization, <laughs> make it more expensive to get colonoscopy, maybe it is higher quality, right? Uh, maybe, I don't know, that's debatable, but prices go up. Um, uh, people, people consume less of that, more people die. So. Yeah, I think just to add to that, um, I think there's a pretty strong case that, um, that our current licensing system reduces access to healthcare. Um, so in some of the ways that I was describing, reducing telemedicine, scope of practice yeah. restrictions, uh, just reducing the number of practitioners. I, I actually, I haven't seen any great work on the, the link between licensing and healthcare cost. And to me, at least, it seems like there are different possible countervailing considerations. So on the one hand, you could say more competition would bring down costs. Uh, on the other hand, just giving people more access to healthcare will tend to drive up health, total healthcare spending. Um, so that, that may not be a bad thing. We may think this is spending worth, worth doing, but um, uh, it's, it's not completely obvious to me that it would reduce costs. Um, and then in, in, in specifically, I, I'm there uh, in the scope of practice context, I know that um, nurse practitioners, uh, one of the points that they make uh, is that they should be paid the same rate as doctors for the same services, which, which seems reasonable, but it also kind of gives me reason to believe that maybe if you expand scopes of practice, we'll end up um, you know, paying all of these healthcare providers the same amount, and it won't actually reduce healthcare spending that much. Um, in terms of your comment about uh, whether we're seeing kind of growing political momentum to address this problem, uh, one thing that I have found interesting is I think there's actually some evidence that the, uh, the expansion of health insurance under both the ACA and previously under Medicare has kind of led to uh, increased political pressure to uh, reduce some of the licensing barriers to healthcare providers. So there, there was a great fear when the ACA was passed that there would be a doc shortage, there wouldn't be enough physicians to treat all of these newly insured patients. And so that actually, a number of states have cited that as a, as a reason for why they should expand their scope of practice restrictions for, uh, for nurses. So we're actually out of time, and I, I apologize. I know there's more questions out there, and, uh, but I want to respect everyone's time and, and, and on time. So I really want to thank the panel, and thank you for the audience for your questions. Appreciate it.